1, 2, 3. Just appear everywhere and also they satisfy all kinds of cool identities One thing I don't know is how to calculate their derivatives So this is what we will see today in this video Yippee! Excusez-la! So what we're studying in this video is trig functions and their derivatives. All right, so in this video, we're gonna study trig functions. So there's six trig functions, but there's really two fundamental ones, namely the sine function and the cosine function. The other four trig functions can be obtained in terms of these two. So in fact, if it was just for me, there would be only two trig functions, sine and cosine, and that would be it. But given that the other trig functions are commonly used and you may encounter them in physics and science in general, we will study them as well. All right, so the first other one is uh, the reciprocal of sine of x, which is given its own name. It's called the cosecant function. So this is one over sine of x. And similarly, the reciprocal of the cosine function is called the secant function. And there's two other trig functions. First, there's the tan function, which is given as the sine of x over cos of x. And then the reciprocal of the tan, which is called cotan function is given by cos of x and sine of x. So you see that the four other ones can be written in terms of sines and cosines. So in the end, you can write everything in terms of sines and cosines, but pre pretty often it's faster to deal directly with tan, cotan, cosecant, and secant. So we'll study those as well. Now, before we keep going in this video, if you are not familiar with uh, trig functions, if you've forgotten some of these properties, the trig identities, and so on, you are encouraged to look at the appendix D in the textbook and also the summary sheet for lecture one, where I review some of these trig identities. I'll start by studying the sine function. What I want to do is calculate its derivative. So what we'll do is just calculate it from the definition of the derivative. But before we do that, let's just think a little bit. What do we expect the derivative to look like? Well, if I think of the sine function, I can sketch its graph. And what you'll get is an oscillating function that kind of looks like this. All right, and then we can try to guess what the graph of the derivative function will be just by looking at the slope of the tangent lines. So first you see that there's a number of points here where the tangent line has zero slope, so it's horizontal. So the derivative will intersect the x-axis at these points because the slope, the output of the derivative function, which gives the slope of the tangent line, will be zero. And if we take, for example, these two points here between these two, then we see that the slope of the tangent line is positive the beginning is very small, becomes bigger, reaches a max, then becomes smaller again. So the function will look like this, a derivative function. And it's easy to convince yourself that if you look at the other points here, you end up with something like that. All right, so what function has this graph? Well, this is just a cosine function. So just by looking at the graph of the sine function and the tangent lines, we can guess that the derivative of the sine function should be the cosine function. But now we need to prove that. So what I'll do next is to prove that from the definition of the derivative. So I want to calculate the derivative f prime of x from the definition of the derivative. So this is defined as being the limit as h goes to zero of the difference quotient. So f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And then I can substitute here the function for the sine function. So I get sine of x plus h minus sine of x over h. All right, but how do I evaluate that? It's not so obvious, but then you may recall uh, one trig identity, which is called the addition formula, which could be useful here. So we know that the sine of x plus h from the trig identities will be equal to the sine of x times the cosine of h plus the cosine of x times the sine of h. Now, if you don't remember this identity, you can look back at the appendix in the textbook or the summary sheet for the first lecture. This is a very useful identity, and maybe it will be useful here. So let's just try. Let's just substitute that in our limit and see what happens. So I'm going to replace sine of x plus h by this expression, sine of x cos of h 
plus cos of x sine of h minus sine of x whole thing divided by h. Okay, what can I do next? Well, there's two terms here that involve uh, sine of x. So I'll just factor out the sine of x for these two terms. So I'll get sine of x, first term will give me a cos of h. Here I'll just get a minus 1 over h. And then I get the remaining term here, which will be cos of x times sine of h over h. Okay, so there's quite a few steps, so just stay with me. Now what we want to do is just use limit laws. So first we can we have a limit of a sum, so we can write that as the sum of the limits. So I get limit of sine of x cos of h minus 1 over h for the first one. And then the second one here gives me the limit of cos of x sine of h over h. And then we'll use the limit laws again because each of those is a limit of a product of functions which is equal to the product of the limits. So I get the limit as h goes to 0, sine of x, the first one, times the limit as h goes to 0, of cos of h minus 1 over h, plus, again I use limit laws, limit as h goes to 0 of cos of x, and limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h. All right, and then I'm almost done. Because here what I can see is the following. Well, first, limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x, this is just equal to sine of x, because sine of x does not depend on h, right? So it's really just a constant with respect to h. So the limit here is just the sine of x itself. Similarly here, the limit is just cosine of x. However, the other limits here are very interesting. So you've seen that uh, you can prove using the squeeze theorem that this limit is actually equal to 1. And it turns out that using very similar methods, you can prove that this limit here is going to be equal to 0. So this is not obvious, because if you were just substituting h equals to 0 in here, you would get 0 over 0, just like here. So you need to uh, evaluate this limit somehow, and the squeeze theorem is the way to do it. All right, but now I'm not going to do it here, so we'll just assume that this is correct, which is indeed correct. So if we have this, then we get 0 times sine of x plus 1 times cosine of x, so in other words, the derivative of the sine function is equal to the cosine function, which is exactly what we predicted by looking at the graph. All right, so we found that the derivative of the sine function is equal to the cosine function. And in fact, you can calculate in a very similar way, so I'll leave that as an exercise, that the derivative of the cosine function is not quite the sine function, but rather minus the sine function. And the minus sine is very important here. You should never forget it. All right, and now how do I calculate the derivative of the other trig functions? Well, remember that all the four other trig functions can be rewritten in terms of sines and cosines. So we can calculate the derivatives just by using the quotient rule and the fact that we know the derivatives of sines and cosines. So I'm just going to do here uh, one example, but you can do the three other ones along very similar lines. Okay, so I'm going to calculate now the derivative of the tan function. So what is this? This is going to be the derivative of sine of x over cosine of x. And to calculate that, what I'll do is just use the quotient rule, because this is the quotient of two functions. So what do I get? Quotient rule is low d high minus i d low. Draw the line and square below. Okay, and then I just need to substitute the derivatives for the sine and cosine functions. So I cosine of x times cosine of x minus sine of x times, now derivative of cosine is minus sine of x, whole thing over cosine of x, cosine square of x. Okay, cosine times cosine, this is cosine square, and minus minus gives a plus, so I get plus sine square of x over cosine square of x, but now remember from trig identities, cosine square of x plus sine square of x is just 1. So again, 1 over cosine square of x. And that would be the answer. But in fact, we usually rewrite that. Remember that the secant is equal to 1 over cosine. So this is equal to secant square of x. So in other words, the derivative of the tan function is equal to secant square of x. All right, so you can calculate the derivative of cotan, cosecant, 
and secant in a very similar way using the quotient rule, so I leave that as an exercise. But the result is the following. So first you have your two fundamental trig functions, so derivative of sine is cosine, and derivative of cosine is minus sine. There's the one we just calculated, derivative of tan is secant square. Turns out that derivative of cotan is minus cosecant square. And the remaining two are that the derivative of cosecant is minus cosecant cotan, and the derivative of secant is secant tan. Now it's very important that you know these formula. Don't forget the signs, they are crucial. Now you may be wondering right now how are you going to memorize these formula, but trust me that we're going to use them so much that after a week or two you will know them anyway.